be half past seven ladies and gentlemen we have our recording on and you'll perhaps be a little surprised to see that we have um a picture of ian on the screen which katie is going to remove shortly but i'm just we're just drawing your attention to the fact that we're very lucky ian's coming to the center on the 9th of april as you see and it's a day-long seminar there are still one or two places left it'll be quite a small gathering you get lunch and you get tea and coffees and that sort of thing you have to pay something but um it will be an opportunity to have us a, a bit more of a tete-a-tete -tete with ian in person on the 9th of april so that's a little bit of advertising so katie could we switch to the normal view now, please? Well, there's Ian, and there are quite a lot of people, and this meeting is being, as we say, recorded. So good evening oh. again, um, ladies and gentlemen. It's very nice to see you all. I see some familiar faces and some new ones. This is great this evening because um, I've been watching Ian write the great book that he has just published for the last 10 years plus. And, you know, there comes a time when a friend is writing a book when you say, how long is this book? And I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that it's very long indeed. And I have read substantial parts of it, not all because it is so long and it's absolutely extraordinary work. And some of you may have read The Master and His Emissary, which came out, what, sort of 12 years ago now, something like that? Yeah, and uh, like that, yeah. which was the, the where Ian took on the vexed, I think slightly dying question of the two hemispheres of the brain and interpreted much psychology and philosophy and physiology and sociology and culture through the very interesting magnifying glass of the two halves of the brain, which um, work together but do do different things. And that gave him um, an opening into all sorts of areas of life, perhaps all areas of life in some cases. And since Ian is a paid up um, a member of what was my own profession, a university teacher of English literature, which he gave up writing a book called Against Criticism, which rather depressed me. <laughs> and then he turned into, be, turned into a doctor and then he turned into a psychiatrist. And now he's a neuroscience researcher and a lot of other things as well, including I think we have to say um, a philosopher and so on. And so this kind of you know omnivorous intellect has now produced what I think is one of the most important books, people say this kind of thing, but really one of the most important books that has been written um, in, in recent years. It's called The Matter With Things, and we're going to talk about the book, but we're talking about the contents of the book. It's not just a, a puff for the book. I mean, there's nothing else to talk about with Ian because he has covered so much and he's covered it so well. So you don't want to hear much more about me or from me. What we'd like to hear is Ian. So I'd like to ask Ian just to just to introduce himself a little bit and just say something about what he thinks he's done writing a 2,000-page book. <laughs> uh, you, you do exaggerate, Lance. It's only <laughs> 1,500, but... Uh... <laughs> it's small um... print. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's rather beautifully laid out. I mean, what I like about it is that it is so beautiful. I, I mean, I entirely by chance um, really happen to be able to have the probably most prominent typographer in the world now living um, do the typography of it. And he's created the most beautiful pages mm. um, and the way that I would, you know, have dreamed of my book appearing. But it is long, it's two volumes, and it's 1500 pages. And it didn't start out like that at all. I, I, I thought I was doing a sort of uh, <laughs> briefer version of The Master and His Emissary, because people said The Master and His Emissary is terribly uh, full of good ideas, but it's rather long. Why don't you write a shorter version? <laughs> and... Um, I do have a chapter on the coincidence of opposites, actually, but uh, it, it turned out that this was turned into a very long book instead, um, because actually I had no interest really in just regurgitating what I'd said with due consideration and thought as to how it was expressed. I had no real interest in uh, sort of undermining that by um, saying rather briefly and crudely something I had said carefully and at length. And uh, it, it occurred to me that this 
difference between the hemispheres is very relevant to the absolutely ultimate questions we have to answer. Who are we? What is the cosmos? What are we doing here? And if the two hemispheres, as I believe, um, and demonstrate, I think, uh, conclusively, have quite different ways of attending to the world, they see quite different versions of the world. If that's the case, when we're after truth, which one are we going to follow? So the first part of the book is my attempt to demonstrate quite how badly wrong the left hemisphere is compared with what the right knows in almost everything. But the catch is that the left hemisphere does the talking. The right hemisphere hasn't got a voice, but it understands very much more. And all those things are expressed implicitly in poetry, in music, in myth, in drama, in ritual, and in spiritual uh, tracts and religious uh, rites. So uh, really what I wanted to do was to guide us in a world where we're constantly being told that uh, science has proved, ha, ha, that um, the world, the cosmos, the universe is pointless, um, chaotic, meaningless. Uh, and when we're hearing that, uh, we're not really hearing anything very intelligent, in my view. Uh, it's usually put forth by people who've not spent very much time thinking in a philosophical way, but have been terribly good at, say, physics or molecular biology or whatever it might be, and think that that gives them the right to tell us um, about our nature and the nature of the cosmos. Nothing could be more mistaken, in my view. And this book is an attempt, my last attempt, because I haven't time to write any more long books, you'll all be relieved to hear. But it is my last and final word, really, on how to re-envisage ourselves in the world before it's too late. You and think... I mean on that, if yeah, I may sure. add, Lance, not hmm. just, um, uh, of course, I say just, but not uh, merely the fact that we are destroying the natural world and poisoning the oceans and chopping down the forests and killing ourselves effectively. But that um, we're, we're reimagining ourselves as machines. And this is something that is very, very important and close to me at the moment. And I think it's a very worrying sign when one sees people talking with glee about humanity will lose uh, its um, sense of self-determination, of not being entirely controlled. We will be controlled. We will be controlled by governments and administrations through our becoming cyborgs. And of course, I don't deal with that particular scenario because it's been dealt with so well by many works of fiction and semi-fiction, but it is something that I think is becoming a reality very fast. Thank you. What? What? When did this all start? I don't mean in your life. I mean, when did this all start in, shall we say, Western history? Is this post Renaissance? Is it post in like? Is it just post Industrial Revolution? I don't think it is. No. I mean, the Industrial Revolution was a very daring. Um, step forward by what I call the mentality of the left hemisphere, the ability to control things, the need to have power over things, and to reduce matter to mere matter in service of the human, uh, without any real idea of service to what end or, or why. Um, I think it goes back further. Um, it's common to suggest that it might go back to say, the middle or later part of the 17th century, or the beginning of the modern scientific revolution, with Descartes and uh, and others, um, l'homme machine, uh, a, a work of the 18th century. But then uh, there is also Plato uh, playing his part in this story, and Parmenides. I have to be very careful because. Um, a number of my friends are greatly devoted to Plato and have pointed out to me how very complex 
he was, which is undeniable. He was both the person who started the rot of a certain kind of um, thinking that opposites can't coexist, but he was also um, a great maker of, of powerful myths, many of which are current in, in uh, the intellectual world today. So obviously a very great mind. But I do think that once the pre-Socratics, and particularly Heraclitus mm -hmm. and uh, Empedocles had sort of um, waned, we started on a path which was then consolidated in certain strands of Christianity through to the Middle Ages uh, and beyond. Yeah, so I, I would put some blame for that on Aristotle as well. I, isn't he a bit more of a sort of cataloger and bean counter, which is the rude way of referring to the left hemisphere? More than uh, absolutely paper. right, yes. And one m must mention Aristotle, although I have a couple of reasons for thinking well of Aristotle. One is that he was one of the first empirical scientists, um, although that's not quite fair to... Um, uh, Thales, uh, Empedocles, uh, Heraclitus, but he certainly took it much further than anyone in the West had taken it. And the uh, which I, I do very much admire because um, I'm not anti scientific at all, as those of you who know my work will easily see, but I'm very worried by the fact that science has become itself unscientific in mm -hmm. its. Uh, dogmatic rejection of certain uh, possibilities. The other thing I, 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 I rather like about Aristotle is that he did privilege um, the world in which we're incarnated um, over a world of abstractions, which I think is somewhere in the left hemisphere of the brain. Um, and of course, Plato privileged the concepts, the abstract concepts, mm -hmm. over and above their manifestations in the incarnate world that we inhabit. And I think that was a, a, a problem too. Mm, if I, I've always noticed in discussing things with you and reading you that although you could be thought to want something more romantic or, or spiritual by asking what we've done to the right hemisphere and not enough of that. You will also speak up. When I remember first discussing it with you, I remember I was surprised that you spoke up so warmly for the body. I remember you saying it's a great part of what we are. So this let, let's say your resurrection or, or giving some more juice to um, the right hemisphere, which, which is, I suppose, the more spiritual or holistic side, isn't against the physical or against science. Not at all. And um, in, the, in the sense of the physical, it's interesting that the right hemisphere seems to, uh, yes, be probably... It's not a cut and dried thing. It never is. Uh, as you can imagine, these areas are complex. But probably the main part of what we mean by spiritual practices and spiritual uh, experience is underwritten by the right hemisphere, either the right frontal cortex or the right temporary parietal cortex, depending on what one's dealing with. But it's also very true that the right hemisphere is more in touch with the body. Uh, in a number of ways. For example, it is the right hemisphere that has what's called the body image, which is not a, a visual image only, but an image in every kind of sensory modality. Uh, it's also the right hemisphere that has more profuse connections between the um, frontal cortex and the limbic system, which is the part of the brain where emotion and cognition are fused. Mm -hmm. And it also has more input to the autonomic nervous system, which controls bodily function. So these are not all or nothing things, but what's interesting is that both the body and the spirit are there. And I've always thought that the body and the spirit are not in any way antagonists. They are, in fact, cooperative, co-molded. They are interpenetrated one with the other, which doesn't mean that either depends entirely on the other, but it does mean that while we are in this world, they are very, very close to one another. And what's marvellous about Christianity is that it has this image of incarnation right at the core of its beliefs. So that's a wonderful thing. 
Yes, yes, indeed. I mean, I think it's worth saying that the rhetorical and logical strength of looking at everything through the perspective of the two hemispheres is absolutely terrific, but it's almost bound, even when you're speaking, it sometimes comes out, it's almost bound to give us um, you know, in the red corner and in the blue corner. And, it, and as if you, you know, Ian seems to be cheering on one side a bit more than the other. But I think, and I'm going to sell this to people, and you, you could disagree with me, but I don't suppose you will because it's quite a compliment, is it, it, that you are a holistic man. I've never known you turn your face either fully um, towards, which is my one thing, but I've never known you turn your face in any way absolutely against any of the things like cognition, emotion, abstraction, science, the body, all the things which get separated up. And I suppose, <laughs> I mean, I'm going around in circles because you're trying to exercise your, your right hemisphere. You're trying to, you're trying to use the, the, the broader and the rather neglected hemisphere in order to include everything. But that means including everything, including the left hemisphere. Is that about right? Yes. Well, it is. And um, the simple thing to say about that is that, uh, of course, the brain is asymmetrical. The right and left hemispheres are not symmetrical. But there is also an asymmetry in their relationship. It seems that the right hemisphere is aware of the need for the processing that the left hemisphere carries out, if you like, on its behalf. But the left hemisphere cannot be aware, seems not to be aware of what it is the right hemisphere knows. So knowing less, it thinks it knows more. Um, and I've discovered in more recent years in looking at uh, Chinese, Japanese, Indian mythologies, the mythologies of the North American native people uh, and, and others, that there are these myths um, which talk about an unequal relationship between two forces, one of which should always be in control of the other. And everything goes well as long as the one that knows less is under the control of the one that knows more. But when this left uh, spirit, as it were, <laughs> the left hemisphere spirit, um, starts to um, overthrow uh, it, its, its rightful master, uh, it usurps, then things go wrong, civilizations collapse. This has been, um, as I say, a constant theme in people's experience of life expressed in various ways through mythology. And it's also what Einstein um, reportedly, I don't think anyone can trace this quotation, but it's very much true to his spirit. Um, Einstein's uh, summary that the um, the reason is a, a valuable servant, but intuition is a precious gift. We live in a world that honours the servant but has forgotten the gift. So I think that is really the summary that we need to... If I seem to be cheering for the right hemisphere, it's partly because the right hemisphere actually does know more and is more um, likely to achieve the sort of ends that we would like to see for humanity. And it's partly that at the moment it's, it's completely... Um, overwhelmed by the the sort of sabotage by the thinking of the left hemisphere's mechanistic power seeking control seeking thinking which milton of course portrayed perfectly in paradise lost and effectively the whole point about satan is that he is resentful and craves power uh, and that is the undoing of um, well of him and of mankind mm. And just, just to remind everybody, as long as I've got this right, the point of your title in the previous book, The Master and His Emissary, was more or less that the um, right hemisphere is, is, is bigger, I mean, has, has the bigger view, and therefore should be the master, which is what you've just said. And, and, and you know, the left hemisphere is fine, it does its job, but it should see itself slightly more as, as the emissary. Whereas it's, it's a little bit like, um, I don't know, what happens on a, on, on a chess board? Um, you know, the king is, is the most important person, but the, yes. the, the, the vizier, which is the original queen, you know, his, his sidekick yes. gets sent around the board actually doing all the tidying up and organising, and the king is a bit impotent there. So it's rather sort of... Very chess. nice. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I like that. Very okay. good. 
Well, I mean, yes. just look, you've gone. Sorry. Mm. No, no. I was, I was going to say, um, just to 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 carry on a very little there. Um, another way of thinking of it is uh, that the left hemisphere, which actually is literally interested in tools and machines manipulating things, is also, if you like. Um, adopts the role which is the one we would assign to a very clever tool or machine, a computer. Now, I, I resist very strongly the uh, idea that the brain is um, some form of a computer. It's not at all like a computer for a whole host of reasons I go into in this book. But it is in the, it's true that the left hemisphere is a bit like the right hemisphere's personal computer in a certain respect, that the right hemisphere understands much more of what we would call experience. And it realizes that it needs to process certain things in a way that if it were to do that, it would lose its grasp of the whole picture. So it has, as it were, evolutionarily delegated um, a relatively um, limited uh, 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 resource that will deal with things in that way. And it's sent off to do that business. But like the computer, it doesn't understand what the data that are put in means. It doesn't understand what its output means, but it does actually do the business of crunching the numbers. And in a way, that is a, a rather crude image, but it, it's a fairly um, informative image about the relationship between the hemispheres. And what that means is that the left hemisphere is effectively abstracted from the world in the way that a computer program is. Um, I, I sometimes use Korzybski's uh, image of the map and the terrain, that the right hemisphere understands the terrain. The left hemisphere mistakes its map of the terrain for the terrain itself. And that seems to be where we're now living. We're living in a world where we have a theory about life, which is incredibly much simpler than the complexity of life itself that none of us can completely understand. And the theory has now displaced experience so badly that even when our theory is laughably, ludicrously out of touch with what our experience tells us, we nonetheless say, oh, yes, this is right. This is the theory. We must go along with this. And that is happening in the big institutions of the West, which are falling prey to some very, very simple mistaken ideas. Mm. Mm, yes, indeed. Um, so would, would it be too simple to bring it right down to earth if you, if I asked everybody on this call what they'd done today, there would have been work and there would have been domestic chores and quite a lot of things like that. But most of us, it's been a particularly nice day in Edinburgh, most of us will have gone out at some point and enjoyed the sunshine. Now, is it too much to say that those, I mean, imagine you're number crunching because you're working in a bank or a tax office or whatever it is, and as it were, you look up from your desk. I mean, is this too crude? You get up from your desk, you go outside, and something does happen to your body and your mind and your spirit as you look at the sun or feel the warmth of the sun. Something does happen. Now, is, is that too absolutely simple a version of where the two hemispheres have their place? Well, I mean, it would be too simple if people understood from that, that, you know, the feelings that one has about that beautiful day come only through the right hemisphere. Mm. Nothing comes only through mm. one hemisphere. Everything is shared by the hemispheres. And what I'm talking about is um, I, what could, from a certain point of view, be thought of as relatively small differences, but taken together, they are they add up to an enormously different take on the world. And uh, what you rather nicely uh, illustrated in that example is how close the body and spirit and values that we uh, esteem are. Uh, I always say that materialists are not people who overvalue matter, but people who undervalue matter. There's nothing mere about matter. Matter is as curious and as difficult to understand as is consciousness itself. Mm -hmm. And one of the mistakes that's made 
um, by some scientists is to think that if they can only explain consciousness in terms of matter, they will have helped us because matter is something we understand. And it's always better to explain something you don't understand in terms of something you do. But the reality is, many physicists will tell you is that we haven't the foggiest idea of what matter is. And to explain one enigma by refer reference to another is not really that helpful. <laughs> we, that, that's terrific, Ian. We, we thought, we thought we did, didn't we? I mean, there was a point mm. before quantum mechanics, before Einstein, mm. when we thought we'd more or less got matter hacked. And so it was quite a, a noble project to try, I mean, it's ludicrous, but n noble in a way, to try and reduce everything to that, because then we would have a total explanation of everything and we, we would know who we are. But just as, I mean, in, in the very time when certain elements of modern spirituality were coming forward, you know, around the uh, turn of the 19th, uh, 20th century, and then again in, in the 20s, and then again in the 60s with the New Age, just as a more sophisticated and perhaps less religious kind of spirituality was burgeoning, you know, and people were saying, you know, well, come on, you know, all that's woo-woo. The very woo-woo merchants, if they looked, you know, under their chairs, they would have seen quantum mechanics busily undermining their certainties. So, I mean, yeah. you know, whose who's, who's uncertainty do you want, I suppose, is what we're saying here. It's not as if there's one sure solid thing. It's not even solid, is it? And, and, and then a sort of woo-woo thing. The, 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 the blue and the red corners here are, are more evenly, evenly matched. <laughs> Well, well, certainly there are, there are no certainties. That, that's that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> the aspiration for certainty through matter is even more foolish than the aspiration for certainty through spirit. I, I think you you would have to say. Um, well, you, you you've never been um, frightened of things, Ian. And I notice that if you look at the index of your the contents of your of the matter with things, your new great book. Um, one of the big words that appears, and then of course appears in the chapters themselves, is the word truth. And I wondered, yeah. I mean, you have big words there, you have reality, you know. Mm. Is there something special about truth that, I mean, philosophers used to talk about truth, I think they do a bit less now, but you talk yeah. about truth. Is, yes. this, is this tactical? I mean, where are you going with that stress? Well, I make very clear that there is no single truth and truth is not something we can ever say we have for certain. Mm. Uh, but to abandon the concept of truth altogether, which certain strands of postmodernism, as mm. you know very well, uh, have attempted to do, is, is I think, a vast mistake. Um, it, it, it's... Um, I, I mean, if, if one really believed there was no truth, then there would be no way of discriminating any reason for doing or saying anything at all. <laughs> so we clearly don't behave as though certain things are not truer than others. Um, and we couldn't get out of bed or have breakfast or so on and, and, unless we thought that there were certain degrees of truth. So really all I'm saying is, um, how do we get hold of those degrees of truth? And, and you'll notice that the first um, volume is called The Paths to Truth. I don't say the paths that will give us truth, I say the paths to, towards truth. Mm -hmm. And what are they? And I look at the various, well, I look first of all at the difference between the hemispheres and then at science, reason, intuition and imagination as probably the, the main sort of pathways. Mm -hmm. um, and it, the second volume, which is part three, confusingly, of the book, is the metaphysics. Uh, and I call it, what then is true? Mm. And it's a question. And it's mm. deliberately a question because I can't answer it finally any more than anyone else can. But I hope that by coming with me on this path and on this journey, people will see that they can fairly reliably see certain trends in the thinking that is offered to them that are more worthy of respect, more likely to be fruitfully followed than others. Yes, yes, of course. I mean, I, I think that's it's that scepticism in a way, isn't it, in its very good sense, in the sort of Pyrrho sense of scepticism, that you're not going to... Yes. He, he didn't want finalisation. And I have to say... Um, 
uh, I'm a little bit more um, in, interested in the postmodern and, and the post-structuralist, I think, than, than you are. And I think one of the strengths of postmodernism is not so much when it descends into silly relativism, but when it points yeah. out that there's a difference between, as it were, small truths and big truths, the sort of big finalizing yeah. truths. You know, its attack on on the on the grand narratives and so on seems quite good, and and that it, it operates just in the most ordinary everyday way. Um, you might be pushed to say, well, at the moment, for example, what is the nature of, or the being of, or the meaning of Russia? And you would have a lot of things to say about that, and some of them would be self contradictory and so on. But you can be sure that Russia isn't China. In other words, yeah. as it were, there's a sort of basis of negative truths, which if you're desperately thinking, I can't determine exactly what it is to be French or, you know, I don't know exactly what it is. Is this a poem or not? And you then there will be opinions and gay categories will be produced. But you do know that a poem is not an engineering manual. You know, you, you'd only be a game to pretend that it was. And you do know that France isn't Argentina. So it's that negative side where I think some elements of smaller truths reside. D does that appeal to you? Yes, it does. Uh, two things. Um, one is that um, you, you, you draw attention to the fact that often truth is... Uh, achieved by a negative path, the apophatic path, as it's called in philosophy of religion. Um, and, uh, and that is importantly also true of science. Science can never prove something to be the case. It can only prove that to its satisfaction something is not the case. And even there, the second element comes in, which you referred to, which is the, the size of what is being dealt with, i.e. the importance of it. And uh, you, you suggested that um, trivial truths, um, you know, we can be relatively certain about, but the big ones, the bigger they are, the harder it is. And that is also reflected in Niels Bohr's comment that whereas, you know, small truths um, clearly um, exclude their opposite, uh, the bigger the truth, the more likely it is that the opposite of it is also a big truth. So, for example, um, it simply is a matter of record that I had milk in my coffee this morning and it's not equally true that I had black coffee this morning. But when it comes to the big questions that interest you and the centre and me, then, of course, we have to abstain from that level of assertion of certainty. Yes, of course. And I mean, one of the commonest things, I teach poetry and spirituality here, and, and there's a lot of discussion of other things other than poetry around around in our centre. And one of the one of the words that keeps coming up, whether it's a, a, you know, Raymond Moody talking about near-death experiences or, or someone um, pondering over some lines of T.S. Eliot, is a word like the ineffable. I mean, you know, the, the, uh, someone who's had a wonderful experience, they say, I saw these extraordinary colours, but I can't describe them. You know, the, 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 the sort of grander the claim, as it were, the less clear we are about what we know. That would be yes. a summary, something like that. I think that. I think that's right. And I think also there's an element of, um, there's a two-way thing between language and experience, that it's not true that we can't experience something if we don't have a word for it, the so-called Sapper-Whorf mm -hmm. hypothesis. I mean, that has been pretty much completely uh, dismissed, mm -hmm. and, and I treat that very briefly in the in the, both this book and The Master and His Emissary, actually. But... Um, but but it is true that it can colour the way in which you see the world. So we we get used to seeing the things that we can put into words and not seeing the things that we can't. And when I say see, of course, I mean uh, not just visually, but experience and know. And I've noticed, I don't know if you've noticed this, that... Um, after a dream, not necessarily a dream that you can describe any particular meaning to, you are aware that there were experiences, there were even emotions that you simply haven't a name for and can't really relate to anything else. Mm. They're almost sui generis. Mm. And there may be an almost infinite range of feelings one can have. But of course, our vocabulary makes us think that there are half a dozen.
Yeah, you're right. Um, and even on a smaller scale, I'm always puzzled because everybody has the same experience of dreams. Namely, they say, it was Uncle Fred, but it didn't look like him. Or, you know, <laughs> you were in my dream, but it wasn't you. I mean, immediately, yes. it's, it's, you know, straight self-contradiction. And yet, you know, you perhaps have felt a strong emotion or thought things about it. But talking about emotion and thinking, um, th thinking about what, what we stand for at the Arthur Conan Doyle Centre, um, you have a trio in the first parts of your, you know, reason, intuition, and imagination. And I remember as a as a 22-year-old atheist thinking, well, intuition is just sort of woolly, and imagination doesn't have, you're just imagining angels or whatever it is, there aren't angels, and, and reason's the only show in town. And very slowly from then until now, I've gradually moved away from that position and I see the value. But but how, how would you answer uh, the person who has a, a reasonable reason for believing what they believe and someone who says, well, I just intuit or, you know, well, I can just imagine something different. I mean, those are very gross exaggerations that I'm giving you there. But I mean, where is the truth value, as it were, in intuition and imagination, in a word? Well, yes, I mean, that, that, that is what I deal with in the whole part two of, of, of the book. Um, and I also look, uh, by the way, in addition, uh, start, in fact, with science. So I think mm -hmm. science is somewhat separate from reason, although it could be seen as a branch of reasoning, but it, it's not really. Um, and I, I suppose that what I suggest in looking at all four of these is that they have their strengths and they have their weaknesses. There are obvious strengths to science, but there are weaknesses in the sense that it's that there are proper limits to what science can be expected to tell us about. And people who uh, think that it can answer all our questions uh, haven't done enough thinking, in my view. Um, the reason, too, is, you know, obviously a very important tool uh, for being able to discriminate between various paths of thought. But to believe that everything in your life can be um, circumscribed by reason is a kind of madness. And it's not just I who've made this reflection, but a, a, a number of important phenomenological philosophers that when people are so-called mad, they don't, as in the English phrase, lose their reason. They lose everything but their reason and have to start reasoning in a totally irrational way about things that we have an intuitive grasp of. Um, and intuition, obviously, again, I mean, intuitions can be entirely mistaken. One can have an intuition that something is the case, and very clearly it may not be. But I do think that intuition has been uh, very severely ill-served by a group of modern psychologists who have uh, in, enjoyed really um, putting their thumb in the scales uh, when weighing intuition, because it's very nice and makes one appear terribly clever to be able to point out that an intuitive sense that one has of something can sometimes be mistaken. And it's like the feeling you get looking at an optical illusion, you know, it's sort of, can that really be the case? How very clever, but I, you know, I would intuitively have said whatever. But in fact, this parallel, it goes further than one one might think, because um, just as, generally speaking, one's vision doesn't lead one into illusions, though there are such optical illusions, generally speaking, one's intuition doesn't lead one into illusions, though there are intuitive illusions that are set up by clever psychologists to prove that apparently intuitions aren't good. But we've been taught so far to mistrust our intuitions, which are also an expression of the intelligence that we store in our whole embodied selves in different parts of our of our frame in our whole physiology uh, and indeed in 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 that hybrid that is reason with with feeling that is probably the great what used to be called reason as opposed to rationality reason used to be the great achievement of the educated was to achieve this position and not reason didn't mean, meant just following logic like a computer mm. it meant bringing your experience your wisdom from experience your intuitions your emotions to bear along with the ability to rationalize um, and of course imagination is 
um, grossly misunderstood. It's thought of as somehow an alternative to reality, mm. whereas as the, the greatest philosophers of um, imagination in English are Coleridge and Wordsworth, and as they very clearly saw, imagination is what clears away the film of unreality that uh, Shelley refers to between us and the world and allows us for the first time actually to make contact with the real, to experience the real as truly present. So it's not the thing that takes us away from reality, it's the thing that takes us to reality. Mm -hmm. Yes. But what yes, I, I basically <laughs> conclude is that we need all of four of these, if possible, to be brought to bear. Um, at least three of them can usually be brought to bear with, um, with benefit on yes. any question. Yes. Um, yeah, developing one of those points, um, I was very struck in one of Bernardo Castrop's books that he points out <laughs> that you know, materialists who think that all thought or consciousness is limited to the inside of your skull, it's in the brain, um, are, are, are therefore um, absolutely wild idealists at the same time. Because they're saying that things like my idea of Everest is not you know, in Tibet or Kathmandu or you know, in Nepal, whatever it is, it's in here. And that my idea of you sitting here now is not over there in the screen, in the picture, but it's inside here. So that we are the people, the materialists then become the people whose minds are creating the world. But I thought that was meant to be what idealists do. I mean, I mean that's a very yeah. deconstructive argument that Bernardo Castro effectively launches absolutely on on your side, and I, I may say he's a he's a fan, um, and he has several other others of those paradoxes, like the the classic one that um, the the most um, clearly established basic thing in the physical world, namely the quantum, is nearly all not there and unstable. Yeah. Whereas we thought of yes. it as there and and stable. Well, moving on a little bit, then um, you, you deal with imagination. I think that's that's got a lot, a lot more to say. To say, but because of where we are tonight, I, I want to push on through intuition. I mean, I mean I, there are several people I know who who work in and with the Arthur Conan Doyle Centre who are who who claim to be highly intuitive, uh, and indeed. Yes. Um, and not a million miles from here is sitting a, um, a, one of our employees who was appointed entirely on the intuition of the person who interviewed her. And uh, she was the least likely candidate and she's been the most marvelous employee you could possibly imagine. And the intuition just worked in a way that the person, not me, who had the intuition um, knew that it was going to do. There's a great certainty about that. I thought that was very interesting. But yes. as, as we move from that, I mean, that's a little sort of paranormal story and we are interested in those paranormal things here. I mean, I, I would hope that we could consider questions like um, the intuitive as leading into questions like might be the telepathic or that might be um, the, the, the vision which people have or, or, the, or the communication they have with the dead. That's that's quite a leap. But at least if you're giving some value to intuition and imagination, it opens a space. And that's what I've always hoped that the that, that science would do that. And I don't think it does very much. And we do try. And I think you do open a space for things moving towards the spiritual. Is that a, a summary which you could go along with? Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, uh, provided though uh, that one slightly glosses, because there are two meanings of the word spiritual. Mm -hmm. So I, I certainly embrace and open up to the idea of a spiritual realm, which is the most important realm in which I think the human operates. Um, it sometimes uses a shorthand for paranormal, parapsychological um, experiences. Um, which I certainly um, don't in any way dismiss, but I, I don't have very much to go on in my own experience. I, mm. I think I've told you that I, I don't think I've been blessed with any of these experiences, so I envy people who have been. And I definitely don't think they can be dismissed. And I suppose what one is pointing to is that intuition manages to keep open more doors mm. 
than um, the purely rationalistic uh, does. Um, in a way, you illustrated that rather beautifully by talking about the appointment where somebody just knew that this was the right person. Of course, that wouldn't be allowed now in, a, in any sort of corporate setting because you have to lay out your, your grounds for doing this and also tick boxes about you know, how you've met various um, optimal criteria for appointment. So uh, that, that's just no longer possible. But uh, it's been pointed out um, that, in fact, one ought to be encouraging people who make decisions, big decisions, to use their intuition, because intuition can take into account and balance perhaps 15, 20 different considerations, which when you start speaking about it logically, have to be narrowed down to one single line, which is what you, you pursue. So it's a very much more defined, closed off sort of business. And in life, we can't know that that's the best way to be. Uh, probably the best way to learn from experience is to be uh, relatively open, and I try to steer the path between being, um, uh, you know, uh, perhaps rather um, uh, over impressed by things that are maybe not too impressive, and 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 not dismissing things that actually um, have a great deal of evidence. And it's not good enough just to say, well, there's no evidence. There's plenty of evidence. It's it's remained in many of these areas difficult to be sure what one's dealing with, but that's surely an area that requires further experimentation, not one that requires less experimentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's absolutely crucial. I mean, we had we had Raymond Moody on um, last week, um, and I've been corresponding with him and reading some stuff by him, and um, and we've had uh, great experimenters like Rupert Sheldrake, as you know, and and there's absolutely yeah. no doubt that more information will produce more results, and they will be slightly different, and that's true of all areas of knowledge. You know, I mean, except a few areas such as you know, phlogiston theory or phrenology, you know, where we have managed to draw a line because there was nothing to be said for it at all you know many other things um, repay attention and there's absolutely no doubt that both aspects of the spiritual repay attention and need more of it mm. listen um Ian, it's traditional for us to for the speaker to go on for three quarters of an hour which i'm afraid we have now done um Right. But we can carry on. But what I'd like to say is that everybody here, um, if you would like to put a question in the chat or or wave a hand, quite a lot of us, it might be better to put things in the chat. I, I can summon you from the depths or read your question or whatever you prefer. So, I mean, I do have one from Nick Kyle, um, which I'm going to ask in, 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 in just a moment. And um, perhaps we could look around and maybe Katie might like to unmute um, Nick Kyle just while I ask another question and generally look around for any others. Um, my question is simply that um, the final part of, of your book um, dares to talk about the sacred, which I feel is implicit in everything else you've been saying. And it's quite extraordinary that you've managed by just looking at two halves of people's heads to get right through everything up to uh, and including the sacred. But um, you, you're happy with that word, are you? You think things are sacred. Oh, I'm very happy with that word. Um... Uh, after all, in a way, sacred talks about the attitude that we hold towards something. So um, I suppose what you're saying is, um, I not only think that we do hold that attitude towards things, but we're right to do so. And mm -hmm. I think we are right to do so. Um, I can't uh, define because, of course, these, the whole point is that we are dealing here with things that can't be limited by everyday language. Um, as the opening of the Tao Te Ching says, the Tao that, that, that can be named is not the real Tao. <laughs> and there are similar things in almost every spiritual tradition. So um, I can't exactly say what it is, but I uh, that chapter is a short book in itself, really. Uh, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> in terms of length. But I do try to paint what the, the fruitful areas are by, um, rather as a sculptor, creates a statue by clearing away stone, not by putting it together, that I, I, I build a picture that way. And as you say, um, it follows in a way from the general trend of the book, although I don't think the word is, well, it, it may be incidentally there, but it's certainly not discussed earlier in the book. That That's a very nice observation that was made by 
a very um, astute reader who was saying that he found that the book was um, a bit uh, fractal, that the same shapes and forms in different parts kept recurring, sort of bigger, and that one, as it were, knew where the, the territory was getting to be built up in a way that made it coherent and familiar. Mm. So I hope that is the case. Yes, I, I what think... I hope is that by mm. the time... By the time the reader has got to the last chapter, the last substantive chapter about the sacred, um, they will have gone from a position where they probably started saying, well, sacred, I don't hold much for that, you know, and to, to, to a position where they think, well, probably only a fool could dismiss it. <laughs> yes, I, I think that fractal is an extremely good way of describing your argumentation, and it's clearly better than what looks like a more syllogistic, you know, logical uh, thing. And not that you're illogical. Um, so, Nick, um, you're there, and I think you're able to speak. Nick would like to ask a question about the number of hemispheres. <laughs> uh, you need to unmute yourself, Nick. I didn't. I thought we had. You have to unmute yourself. I think. Um, no, I'm sorry, we're not getting you. Uh, Nick, could you see if you're muted on your laptop? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Great. Yes. Um, I, I like simplicity, and I need simplicity, Ian, because um, I would defer to your uh, extensive knowledge compared to my uh, knowledge. But I've always thought that the brain was way too complex to be usefully divided into only to spheres or hemispheres. And I, I often thought perhaps there should be three, four, or indeed a, a real multiplicity of operating spheres within the brain. And I once came across a hologram, and it was pointed out to me by the, the maker of the hologram that you only need a tiny piece of the hologram, and you can still encode much of the image, perhaps all of it. And I, I thought that was a good model for the brain, but it's much more integrated and connected than to simply split it into two. Nick's frozen. I, I know that you'll have a, 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 an answer which shows your knowledge, but how we are thinking about, is it not more like a hologram than a two, two pieces? I, I'm interested in consciousness, but I'm interested in how the structure of consciousness can be articulated. And some people would claim it, it reflects the brain in some way. So I wondered if you could comment on that too. Yes, all, all very good and interesting. I mean, of course, um, what we've been able to discuss so far is a fraction of 1% of what I'm talking about. So one might run away with the idea that I think the brain is quite simply two hemispheres. Um, it's it's not quite simply anything, and it, it, it has as many areas of interest as you like. Um, it's conventionally divided into a very large number of such modules or areas of function. And I, I'm not denying that at all. But the only thing about that modular idea is that I think it needs to be tempered by your hologram idea, which is that each part, or perhaps not every part, but certainly in, it would be true to say that many parts of the brain seem to be aware of distant parts of the brain and their functioning. And, of course, there's a puzzle of how when some part of um, the brain stops functioning... Uh, the function that would have been uh, uh, subserved by that area of tissue can be taken on by another area. So, I mean, I don't think anybody quite understands how that sense of the whole in the part is achieved, but it's there also in the cell, the single cell, which <laughs> is a, a ridiculously complex um, organism um, with 10,000 different 
uh, uh, chemical reactions going on every second. Um, and in that cell, it seems that uh, when there's damage to part of the cell that isn't directly connected to some other part of the cell, um, the cell knows that it needs a certain kind of repair. So this is shot through the whole of the natural world, this connection between the whole and the part. And, I, you know, um, I, I'm against any kind of binary um, reduction, uh, and I don't reduce the mind to the brain either, but... The fact is that nature created an enormous chasm in the brain. It, 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 it has produced these two physically rather different um, uh, uh, networks, each of which is capable of supporting consciousness on its own and seems to have different ways of attending to the world with different modes of being, being brought forth from the world by that hemisphere. So that would be my answer, probably not satisfactory, but um, I think that's all I can say for now anyway. Thank you. That's great. Katie, could we unmute uh, Todd Bureau, please? I think he's on the second page. I'm just going to ask his question, but I think he might want to have a follow-up. Um, Ian, this, uh, Todd says, with the apparent increasing hegemony of the left hemisphere in Western culture, what have been some of the strategies that you've personally encountered that can help re-establish a more optimal balance? Yes, well, that's a... A very important question, and uh, I'm probably going to give a disappointing answer. Um, I mean, I think, frankly, at the moment, we're up against it. Um, what I hope is that by making people aware that the, the narratives they are told, the myths they are told by reductionist scientists about what a human being is, um, will appear um, flimsy and that they will feel strengthened in their already wise intuition that this is a wrong way to be thinking. Um, so I think we all have to, as it were, put our shoulders to the wheel to get this, um, <laughs> this thing uh, unstuck. Um, certainly the growth of spiritual practices of various kinds in a non non-overtly religious society has been an important step forward because it introduces people to different awarenesses of the world, which are, to a very large extent, more typical of the right hemisphere than the left. So that's one positive thing. But I, I, I'm extremely worried by the, the pressure um, from uh, the World Economic Forum, famously, uh, from big business, um, the big corporations, to push technology into areas where um, we will become not just metaphorically machines, but almost literally machines with mechanical interfaces controllable by those who have um, no right to control us and not the wisdom that we would wish to be um, in anyone who was able to help us. Uh, the trouble with technology is it, it expands very fast, but wisdom doesn't. In fact, I would say that we're probably the least wise society that has ever uh, lived, and yet we also have the greatest means at our disposal. Um, this is a very dangerous situation. So I think raising awareness is my number one thing, but following certain practices um, and encouraging children very much more to be interested in the humanities which are now being rapidly defunded the libraries disbanded um, uh, and the worth of the great western tradition assailed on all sides for kind of political reasons that really um, have no right to be dismissing this enormous body of um, of creation. So uh, I think we have to guard what is valuable and not go along with attempts to destroy humanity, destroy civilization. Todd, do you have some suggestions and from your own life or your own thinking? 
Well, I do think um, I'm unguardedly optimistic. I think forums such as this that uh, show increased interest in these matters. I mean, COVID certainly put us all in an online world, but um, I've noted to what degree there's far more folks engaging in this and then that exchange of information across the world and in and, and similarities and outlooks and, and nuance. Um, to me, that is the encouraging, these are the bright spots, the lifeboats that can that allow those thinking, that thinking to permeate those that um, either don't think about it or are inherently skeptical. Um, that's one of my observations. Um, I did just get confirmation for a certain gathering in Perry in June, and I look forward to uh, badgering Ian further in a fine medieval town. So thank you. <laughs> but that... Um, <laughs> well, we I look forward to the experience, but uh, no, of course you're you're entirely right to point to that optimistic side. Um, it's not that it doesn't exist; it's just that the more pessimistic things are so worrying to me. But you're quite right that technology is as good or as bad as the uses to which it is put. I'm just questioning the wisdom of the. Um, people who hold much of the power in our political and economic sphere who have um, sometimes somewhat psychopathic and narcissistic um, tendencies. Um, so that's the worry. I mean, I it would be quite um, wrong for me to, or hypocritical for me to um, dismiss the value of technology because I couldn't have written this book or publicised it and it wouldn't have had the success it's had at my writing if it were not for the internet. So, you know, there we are. I reach many more people that way. Thanks. Thanks, Todd. I hope you enjoy uh, meeting Ian again in Barry. Um, uh, could we um, unmute um, Peter Bruin and Janet Saunders, please? Um, I'll just ask Janet Saunders a question because it's quite straightforward. Um, William Blake talks about Jesus as imagination. What is the imagination, asks Janet? Are there many types and what is their role for us? That's going back to the imagination topic. Hmm. Well, um, are there different types of imagination? There are certainly different things meant by the word, as I tried to hint. So, like Coleridge, I would make a very sharp distinction between fantasy and imagination. Um, indeed, the whole thrust of Wordsworth and Coleridge, and uh, that is partly based on Coleridge's reading of. Um, Schelling, in particular, who's a, um, a, an early 19th century German philosopher that I particularly admire, um, that the whole thrust of um, their allegiance to the imagination was to try to get people away from this idea that it was something pretty and fancy, that was really ordinary life dressed up, like a pastoral scene in which um, counts and countesses played as shepherds and shepherdesses um, uh, uh, in the sort of Augustan way. They were saying, no, this is something much deeper in which the very fabric of the cosmos, um, the business of matter, of, of mountains, of streams of the sky, all these things um, engage the imagination if they're to be understood at all. So actually in a chapter uh, that I have on this exact topic, um, I compare, I think it's about eight to ten things that Coleridge says about what fantasy is and what imagination is and these are precisely the characteristics of in the case of fantasy the left hemisphere and in the case of imagination the right hemisphere i imagine you could also say that imagination covers different areas and different kinds of thinking for example there's imaginative science um, which might be rather different from imaginative art but Ultimately, I think I would resist that partition. But I think what the imagination is, it's single, it's whole and indivisible. And it's reflected in these different areas of life as a landscape is reflected in glass or water. So there is imagination across the board. And what I tried to show is that actually it's imagination that is the most important part of science. A lot of um, extremely pedantic, boring work 
has to be done. It's the price one pays. But in the end, the way science makes its steps forward is through intuition and imagination. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, there are just literally hundreds and hundreds of examples of this in the literature. Almost never was a breakthrough achieved by somebody stolidly writing out sequences of equations. <laughs> I'm sure that's true, and that's beautifully put. Um, I'm turning to Peter now. I feel a bit uh, trepidatious because Peter, I think, has developed COVID. Is that right, dear boy? I have, but I'm going to struggle through it. I hadn't meant to ask the question, uh, Lance, but uh, I'll have a go. I was very struck, Ian, earlier on in your talk by your mentioning the that one of the hemispheres getting out of control and going, go, going, going tonto, you know, going, going, going ape. Um, it seems to me there's a connection there between, you know, very clear connection between the theoretical and the geopolitical when we look at what's happening in the Ukraine. Um, and we actually see one hemisphere, you know, uh, threatening to blow apart the whole body, literally. Um, it's terrifying. We've never lived in such terrifying times. I remember the, I remember 1962 and uh, the nuns telling us that the world was going to end at half past three. Um, and we didn't really take that in fully, but, um, you know, we're getting there again now. Um, we have to, I think, find a way of uniting the, um, the theory and the praxis. And in a way, Nick and uh, I think Todd uh, were asking the same question. So I apologize for that, but um, let's go back to the early 60s when there was a ferment of resistance which uh, encompassed the spectrum of thought of political action, of the arts, of music, everything. Mm. The, 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 mm. the students fought on the streets with the work uh, of Paris with the workers. Um, maybe it failed, but at least there was a, a chance. There's no chance that can be seen now. You, you mentioned that polit politicians are sometimes psychopaths. They're always psychopaths. That's what it's become. That's what the political system has become. And I just wish there was... God, I'm look. I'm actually looking for a hero. I'm looking. I'm looking. I'm holding out for a hero. I'm, I'm looking for a savior who's going to actually emerge and drag the world back into some kind of balance where the two hemispheres are living um, happily and in balance with each other. Sorry. <laughs> well, uh, yes, of course. Um, that 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 would be a marvelous thing. Uh, I, I suspect that as often. Great things come forward only through suffering. Um, in fact, that message is at the core again of Christianity. Um, and it's people like Solzhenitsyn for our generation who, out of the suffering of the gulag, um, was able to inspire by his um his writing and his speaking um, i think that people you know iron enters into the soul and that uh, as seneca said every uh, gem shines because it's been buffeted by by other uh, uh, weapons and and uh, that, that abrade it so i think uh, unfortunately that will I think it will happen probably if it happens in time is a big question where it comes from I don't know but we have to keep hanging on to the idea of humanity that is not either um a sort of sci-fi fantasy of, of cyborgs um, or um, a, a reduced vision of some kind of um, uh, gene-driven mechanism. Uh, neither of these is at all appropriate. We've lost the idea of what a human being is. And I think the, the, the great art of the past was one of the ways in which this idea of what a human being is was promulgated. And we need more of that great art, which also comes partly through suffering and not through the somewhat indulgent sort of ways in which we, including myself now, now live. But, um, but thanks for your reflections, yes. I mean, we, we desperately need something to, to take us away from um, what we're experiencing now. 
Well, Navalny, when the, Navalny's off to the gulag as well, just like Solzhenitsyn, isn't he? I, I know. And the same number of years they've given him. I mean, it's appalling. Yeah. I think Nazardine uh, Radcliffe should stand up for, 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 um, president of, uh, for, for president of the Republic of uh Britain, what do you think? Hands up everyone who agrees. Uh, that's very people. political. More only political people. than we're allowed to be, but that's very good. Um, we can be everything we want. <laughs> very good. Okay. Um, uh, I was going to ask Daniel Ross to be unmuted, but instead, could Katie uh, unmute um, Anne Samuel Till while I ask Daniel Ross's question, because he too has COVID and lost his voice. Um, he says, it seems more straightforward to explain what the left side sees and can do. This reflects reflect its lack of dimension, the fact that it's straightforward to say what it does. But it's far harder exactly. to articulate what the right side sees and is doing. Absolutely. Why? <laughs> because it's real. Uh, it's not just a map that we made up. Um, you are completely right. And... Uh, if I may be forgiven a somewhat, uh, I'll make it very brief, I hope, biographical uh, digression. I wrote a book called Against Criticism in in the um, uh, in my 20s. Um, oh, and uh, in it, what I was trying to explain was that it's all kinds of things that are very hard to put into words that are precisely why we admire literature. And when we are in our literature seminars, the things we come up with are um really what happens when you disembowel a great work of art or you um, tear it into pieces in order to understand it better uh, having destroyed it so it, it's it's all that is implicit it's all that is unique and therefore resists um language and this is known by the right hemisphere but the right hemisphere can't speak and it therefore hasn't developed the language for it because language has been the spoken language has been developed by the left hemisphere to deal with what it is mainly concerned with, which is manipulation, grabbing and getting and controlling um, another parallel with what we're seeing in Ukraine, um, greed, power, con the ne need for control, vanity and so forth. So. Um, Yes, it's it's a very good point. And what one finds is that certain languages like Chinese do a better job than the English language of having concepts that approach these things that are difficult to put in words. But the only way in which even they can achieve them is by being paradoxical. And mm. this was something that was understood already in the 6th century BC by Heraclitus. Um, a great master of, of very powerful and important paradox that we neglect at our peril. And it's getting back to this more complex understanding that a thing in its country may well be true, so that you pursue a certain path. Yes, we must do this in order to have justice or good something. Or other. And we achieve something evil and bad by it. I mean, this happens time and again in history, as the people's revolution of whatever has repeatedly um, uh, taught us over the last couple of hundred years. So um, it's dealing with stuff that is real, and reality is, as physicists have confirmed, complex, resists language, is often contradictory, but it's very, very important. And the left hemisphere's simple toy clockwork version of the world, of course, it's a piece of cake to put that across, which is why, you know, um, one starts with one hand tied behind one's back if one is trying to explain what it is the right hemisphere knows, whereas it's money for old rope to explain the left hemisphere's point of view. Uh, people just go, duh, that's obvious. Of course he's right, uh, whatever his name is, begins probably with a D, they often do. Uh, that kind of thing happens. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's terrific. Thank you. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure that Daniel will feel better from his COVID with that, with that inside him. Um, can I just say there's a, a something which will appeal to Ian, which is just a couple of lines from Wordsworth, which is connected to several of the things we've just been talking about. Um, Wordsworth has, has a sonnet of which the first two lines are: "The world is too much with us. Late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers." 
and that's exactly. right. <laughs> I mean, and there are powers in there, and these would be the powers of the of of the right hemisphere, of course. Um, uh, uh, absolutely. I thought you'd like a bit of Wordsworth in there. Um, and uh, you, know, um, you are unmuted, my dear, if you would like to ask a question or say this point. <laughs> I was just wondering if it's naive. It was when um, Peter said optimistic, um, or somebody said optimistic, sorry. Um, if it's naive to hope that one of the ways to get some balance back in this world that's veering madly to the left um, is meditation. And it made me think, when it, I have heard in the past about experimentations of meditation and, and it being influential, and it uh, made me think about the concept of universal mind, and I'm just wondering where that fits with all your, your one, wonderful stuff. <laughs> I don't think it's naive at all. I think it's right on the money. I think meditation... Um, as I was hinting earlier, these spiritual practices that are now more widespread are important ways of contacting the right hemisphere's world. One of the things about the difference between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere, um, which echoes that vision of the world as it is and the world as it is mapped, is that the right hemisphere is present with the world, allows, in fact, uh, to torture the language a little a la Heidegger, allows the world to presence for us, in other words, to come into being for us with all its freshness and newness and reality. But what the left hemisphere sees a fraction of a second later is the representation. A representation is literally something being made to be present after it no longer is present. And it's in that world of representation that we live most of the time. Now, what meditation does, particularly mindfulness-based meditation, is to take us away from the business of adhering to the representations and instead simply to be silently, peacefully present and to allow the world to come into being without judgment, without monkey mind, the left hemisphere chattering away about it. And in fact, in the book, in um, I think one of the appendices, um, I, I quote um, from uh, a uh, an acknowledged um, Indian guru who who is one of the world's authorities on mindfulness practice has written books about it. I quote a passage from him in which I note 23 things that he says in only a few sentences that show its um, connection to the um, the world of the right hemisphere, not that of the left. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. mm, that, that was good, wasn't it? Yes. Um, could we unmute John Warnock, please? And um, have I missed someone? No, I don't think I have. Is John there? Yes, I uh, think can... I'm muted myself. Okay, thank you. we can hear you, John. Carry on. Um, well, the question that I that I wrote out, let me I'll just read it. Uh, when it comes to breaking the grip of the left hemisphere, the right hemisphere would seem to be at a serious disadvantage. Since the left hemisphere is, as you have shown, the great denier, the great confabulator, immune to what the right hemisphere is able to see as missing or dissonant, et cetera. But over time, over evolutionary time, the right hemisphere seems to have found a way to reassert its mastery, uh, itself as master. How do we think it has done so? Um, because cultivating awareness is precisely what the left hemisphere, you show us that the left hemisphere is very good at keeping from happening. Yes. Well, thank you for um, making that very important point that the left hemisphere is a, a denier and a confabulator. By confabulation, I mean putting a story together um, to explain something that has no roots in reality, but is something convenient that explains it. Um, and this is something quite literal. So the part one of the book is uh, contains an enormous amount of clinical material from patients who've had um, 
partial distraction or dysfunction of either the right or the left hemisphere. And one sees that they can deny the most banned or obvious facts, such as, for example, that the left side of their body is paralysed. They will downright deny it. I um, mean, they will make up stories about things that they have no answer for. Um, we see this reflected in um, our society, again, which I believe is dominated by this approach, um, where the obvious things are denied. Um, we go singing the left hemisphere is always an optimist. It's always seeing that it's not really a problem. It's all under control. We see that happening all the time where people deny the very real things that are threatening us. And we see um, people making up stories about how, um, how the world works, how science works and so on. So I think it's very important. I, I suppose I'm not as clear that, as you are that the right hemisphere has been able to reassert itself as a master. In a way, my slightly um, <laughs> gloomy message in keeping with the right hemisphere is that <laughs> the right hemisphere is, is losing somewhat of its important um, dominion over the left. And, and this is something that when it happens, and in the, ma the, the Master and His Emissary, my earlier book, I show it in the second part, having happened three times in the history of the West, when it happens, civilizations decline. So I see this happening in Greece, in Rome, and then again since the Enlightenment in our own society. One could point to this extraordinarily fertile period of about 50 years um, when there was um, the standing forth of Romanticism, um, which, uh, again, the left hemisphere very cleverly uh, stigmatised this most significant and most sophisticated um, period of modern Western philosophy as romanticism in a way that um, suggests fantasy. Whereas, in fact, I think it was, um, a, a, as I say, the, the most sophisticated a period of modern philosophy, which got closest to uh, an evocation of reality of, of a, any that we have. Um, with, with, you know, again, there, there are exceptions, I have to say, in people like Wittgenstein and Heidegger and Meloponti and, and, and above all, Max Scheler, but, but anyway, yes. So I, I, I think it's, it's touch and go whether the right hemisphere will succeed in, in asserting itself, because at the moment I see this satanic figure. I mean, if, if <laughs> it's a good time to reread Paradise Lost because our world is really showing Paradise Lost. And I had today in my mind um, that wonderful song by Joni Mitchell. I'm a great fan of Joni Mitchell. I think she was a completely brilliant and inspired songwriter, unbearably moving. Um, but one of them, of course, one of her songs was they've paved paradise, made, made, it, made it a parking lot. And I feel like that is literally and metaphorically what we're doing. Mm -hmm. But um, I think, you know, we, we might be able to have another return of that spirit. I mean, let's hope. One should always be hopeful. It's a duty, an obligation and a virtue. But nonetheless, my rational mind is somewhat pessimistic. <laughs> I hope this doesn't sound too um, lighthearted um, after all that, but I do think one of the problems with the philosophy of the Romantic period, whose importance I, uh, I, I agree with you is, is enormous, is that we in, in the Anglophone world and, and to some extent in France got some terrific poetry and poetry's a bit kind of flowery and airy fairy, isn't it? You know, a bit too right hemisphere. The actual philosophy or the, or the core of it was written by some very complicated and difficult Germans, Hegel and, and his followers, Fichte and Schelling and Schleiermacher and these guys. And not many people in the 19th century had German, which was good enough to read these guys. And I once met a German professor of philosophy who was learning English in order to read the English translations of the German Romantic philosophers so that he could understand them. So I, <laughs> the, I love it. You know, the, I mean, you, you you mentioned Schelling. I mean, I'm prepared to bet that there is only one person on this entire call who has ever read a line of Schelling, or possibly none. I can't say I've read a great deal myself. So that might be one mm -hmm. trivial reason why 
we've gone wrong in that direction. Um, okay, but just for the last sort of um, a couple of moments, um, is the language of the right hemisphere telepathy? The right hemisphere doesn't speak. Is it language telepathy? Which with near-death experiences, for example, everybody says that they're communicating with their dead relatives and the beings of light, but their lips never move. It's all telepathic. And of course, we have telepathy on this side of the veil too. Is that the language? Is intuition and telepathy the language of yes. the right hemisphere? Could yes. we... I don't think it's the language of the right hemisphere, but it may be that the right hemisphere is 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 more permissive of it. I mean, I, I, I haven't talked about this, but I view the brain as not um, emitting consciousness or indeed even transmitting consciousness, but permitting consciousness. Mm. In other words, it has a sort of resistant, valve-like relationship to consciousness, which exists in any case. But the brain filters it so that it has a certain shape. Uh, William James has this brilliant image of um, the air passing through his trachea would not enable him to have a voice were it not for the vocal cords that impede the flow. And, and it's through that impediment that the characteristic comes. And um, again, sorry, but one of the big themes of my book is that actually nothing can be created without resistance. Resistance is critical to creation. So there's that. Yes. Um, I think that telepathy in that sense could be um, uh, allowed, permitted uh, uh, to exist through the, the right hemisphere in a way that the left hemisphere makes impossible. That is possible. But I do think that the right hemisphere does have language, and its language is that of um, narrative, myth, um, ritual and poetry, above all. Um, these are the parts of language that are... I mean, in, in the case of, for example, um, narrative, we know that the right hemisphere is much better at understanding the structure of a narrative and retelling it than the left hemisphere. We know that the right hemisphere understands metaphor and um, pitch of voice and inflection of the voice mm -hmm. um, and all these things that are part of the hidden meanings of poetry, the ambiguities. It's much, much better, whereas the left hemisphere tends to go cut and dried. It must mean this or that. It can't mean both and. And that, if I may say, is one of the differences that we need to be aware of, is that the left hemisphere is very much an either-or merchant. The right hemisphere are both and merchants. And that, it, 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 to that extent, it's important that the right hemisphere um, controls this situation because it can then allow both either-or and both and to have their day. Whereas if the left hemisphere is in control, it's got to be either either or, or both and end, and we know which one it votes for, the either or situation. <laughs> Hence, our world is remarkably black and white. I mean, everywhere you hear the ridiculous reduction of complex issues to black and white um, uh, argument. That, that's a marvellous answer. Thank you, Ian. Uh, I'm going to wind up with a comment, or in fact, a question from, um, from Nick. Kyle again. Um, Ian, he says, you might not have time to write more tones. I think if the next one were to take as long as the last one, that might be a fact. But what topics excite you now in terms of being productive areas for future studies? Who do you admire in such fields of inquiry? Gosh, those are two oh, different gosh. questions. What are you going to do yeah, next? Who do you admire? <laughs> Yes, who do I admire is a very, you know, that's a very long question, if you like. Um, the long answer is the only one that's appropriate. Um, can, can you answer the first question then? What are you going to study next? Yes. I mean, you, it, it, what I'd say is if you read the matter with things, you'll so, soon discover a, a large number of people that I greatly admire. Um, uh, one, one of them we've mentioned to, uh, this evening is William James, actually. But uh, anyway, um, in terms of um, where do I go next? I think the answer is uh, uh, I um, 
sort of um, re retire from the fray to a large extent. But I'm hoping to put out a sort of very brief book of aphorisms. I've always wanted to do this. And it seems to me that it should have no critical apparatus um, and no um, endless footnotes and bibliography. So I want to write a very short book that can be read in a comfortable afternoon. What exactly it will be about, I don't know yet, but I didn't really know what any of the books I've um, succeeded in writing was exactly about at the time I started writing. Very true of this book. I felt that I was possessed by a demon in, in you know, daimon in the way that, um, that Socrates would have uh, um, believed possible. That I, I really wasn't quite sure where I was going and it was a ruthless master and it practically killed me. Um, so there we are. Anyway, it's over now and I'm having a bit of a rest. So don't <laughs> ask me what I'm writing. Now, actually, what, I, I, there's one thing I would very much like to do, because I've done all the research for it already, is a book on the art of psychotic subjects, which is absolutely fascinating because of what it reveals and because it's such marvellous art anyway. So that would be an easy book. I could. That would be fun. Right, so, yes. Well, if there are any psychotic artists present, you know, you can get into Ian's book uh, uh, if, if, if you're lucky. Um, I know that Ian did take a, a well-earned rest after 10 years of writing this book in Hawaii, from which he's recently returned. Think of that. Um, isn't that lovely? Well, listen, um, I, I'd like to say thank you very much to Ian for an amazing talk. Um, and I would also like to encourage you, if you would like to get on to the website, the Arthur Conan Doyle website, you might find there is still a ticket for his seminar on, on April the 9th, which is in the centre here. We're opening up to people doing things in the centre and Ian's coming down and, and he'll be there on April, there, Saturday, April the 9th, and he'll be there for an all-day seminar with, in with which you can join. Thank you very much, everybody, for an absolutely marvellous go over this subject. All I can say is that the matter with things, you know, if, if you're looking for reading and, and hoping to go on a very long holiday and want something which won't, won't run out on you, um, the matter with things will keep you going for the rest of your life, as I think probably questions about it are going to keep Ian going for the rest of his. And um, everybody's saying thank you very much in, in the chat, which is very nice of them. Right. And thank you for your questions right. and thank you for everything. So I'm going to bring that right. to an end. Um, I'll be in touch with you, Ian, and I'm no doubt I'll see lots of the rest of you either on the 9th or some other time on Zoom or at the Arthur Conan Doyle Centre. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. And uh, good night. And clapping, clapping for Ian. We can do silent clapping. That's what we do, isn't it, Yeah.